Hey, Pickens uh, physics students. So I hope during this video that the lights don't cut out again like they did on the intro video. But I wanted to give you guys some notes on uh, speed, velocity, acceleration, distance, displacement, um, some stuff with vectors, one dimensional vectors in this video, and also some of the key equations that we can use for one dimensional but also two dimensional motion. And so I wanted to show you guys again the page from the workbook on speed, velocity, acceleration. And you probably remember seeing speed and velocity before, but um, right now we're gonna focus on this distance and displacement. And so if we're thinking about how far, okay, how far something travels. So here's how far, question mark, okay. And we see distance and displacement. And again, you'll notice just like this points out that both words are very similar. Um, sometimes if I'm speaking quickly, I might use these interchangeably, but they are supposed to mean different things. Distance is what we call a scalar quantity. So a scalar is just a magnitude. or an amount. So how far does something travel? That would be distance. And distance would be an example of a scalar. But displacement is an example of a vector quantity. And we'll really get into that and how we work with vectors in a few more minutes. But a vector quantity is going to have um, magnitude and direction. And so displacement is this vector for how far something travels, displacement. And we're looking at those and those are related to speed and velocity because if instead of asking how far, we ask how fast speed would be the scalar associated with how fast and speed as you've already seen on your equation cards is defined as distance divided by time. Whereas velocity is now going to be a vector quantity. So this is going to have a size and direction. And just as speed was defined in terms of distance, velocity will be defined in terms of displacement. So if we kind of keep this general matrix in place, and I'm going to flip this card over for notes for us, and we think about when we would use distance versus displacement, when is it gonna matter when is it gonna matter how far you've traveled without a direction? You could think about walking through the day, right? You could think about how much walking you do through the school day. And so how far do you walk from, let's just say sunrise to sunset? And if you're thinking in terms of distance, this would be the sum of all of your walking through the day. If you have some sort of pedometer, if you have some sort of Fitbit kind of thing, you could track your steps. And based off of your height and your um, stride length, you can convert your steps into a distance, a typical average distance that you've walked in the day. And so how far you've walked, distance, let's just say we're going for the Fitbit goal of like 10,000 steps, whatever distance that translates to or converts to is the distance you've walked through the day. But if you wanted to know your displacement, 
for how far you've walked from sunrise to sunset. Well, if sunrise is when you wake up and get out of your bed and sunset is when you get back into your bed to sleep for the night, that's what the sunrise to sunset is going for, then what's the difference or how did your displacement change from the morning to the evening? If you end up in the same position where you began, then no matter how what you did in between, your displacement then would be zero. So if you end up in the same position as where you began, okay? Um, whereas how fast are you going? If you are driving in a straight line, then that's a time when speed works well, okay? And in fact, if you're driving in a straight line, then if you're going in a specific direction, then you would also have a value for your velocity. But just like ending the day and beginning the day in the same position would give you a displacement of zero, what happens if you are actually moving around in a circle? If you're moving around in a circle, no matter how many times you go around that circle, no matter how long you go around that circle for, if your final position is the same as your initial position, the displacement would be zero. You would end up where you started and you would be dividing zero by time. And so your velocity in this case from start to finish going around this circle would be zero. The only time you would actually have a real velocity is when you're going in a specific direction for the whole movement, okay? Now that's before we get into some discussion with graphs and such, but for now, um, this is what we wanna do when we're thinking about distance and displacement, speed and velocity. You're actually gonna to have to move from one point to a different point to be able to see a non-zero displacement or to be able to see a non-zero velocity. So let's create an equation card for ourselves for velocity. And so velocity is going to be displacement divided by time. And you might want to note that this is a vector quantity. So direction matters. Now we could rewrite this in symbols. So velocity equals displacement over time. Well, displacement displacement, remember, is going to be a vector quantity. And so we could say, like the book has here, we could say delta D over delta T. If we're using delta D for displacement, we could say DF minus DI over TF minus TI. Your book has this knot in here as well. If you're gonna use a knot, then I like to use a T as the subscript on the other variable. Um, the other way you could think about this, of course, is you could say D2 minus D1, one all over T2 minus T1, or you can just keep the delta T in there if, that, if you understand what the delta T means. So this would be key for displacement, okay? Now, this is gonna bring up another nice equation that we can use, which of course is gonna be like the speed one that we used before, but our velocity times our change in time or just T sometimes, however long the motion was occurring for is going to equal our change in displacement. And so knowing this definition of velocity this does kind of give us one of the equations that we sometimes use for um, what's called kinematics and motion. And remember that that delta D would be DF 
minus di. And so we could also rewrite this equation and we could add our initial position to both sides and have V times delta T plus DI equals DF so that you can solve for your final position or your, your final position for that D. Now, in a lot of equations, what you'll see is that this displacement you can substitute in X and Y. You could also substitute in Z if you were going in three dimensions. We're gonna limit ourselves to two dimensions. So if you ever see a V equals Delta X over T, that is this definition of velocity that Delta X also represents displacement. The other thing you should note is that in this particular workbook, which you'll see more of again in face to face, they're pointing out that all vector quantities are introduced with bold type in this text or in this book. Now, the other way that you can see vector quantities expressed, if displacement is delta x, you could also draw a little half arrow over that x to represent a vector. Velocity would be a V, and you could draw a little arrow over that to represent velocity, okay? Um, to represent that it's a vector. And so if you see those arrows, that's also what that means, that those are, that those are vectors. Although in this particular book, the workbook, they'll use bold text for that. It's also important to think about units, and since you're looking at velocity as being displacement divided by time, then the units would be meters per second, and those are the same units for speed. Just keep in mind that velocity will always have a direction. So let's go ahead and define acceleration and create an equation card for acceleration. And and when we look at acceleration. It's defined as the rate at which the velocity changes during a given amount of time. And so acceleration is the change in velocity over time. Again, acceleration will be a vector quantity. And so you could also represent this as a with an arrow. When you look at acceleration and you want to define it in terms of variables, you could write A equals delta V over delta T. Notice that time is not a vector, okay? It does not have a direction, it's just a scalar. But that if you have a vector and divide by a scalar, you still get a vector, okay? Notice that the change in velocity could be expressed as the final velocity minus the initial velocity, and that you could do that over delta t or even just t okay again just like with velocity you could rewrite this equation if you multiply both sides by the delta t or just t then you have acceleration times time equals final velocity minus initial velocity and again you could add the initial velocity to both sides so if you know how fast you're moving initially, plus VI, if you know how fast you're moving initially, then you can solve for how fast you would be moving at the end if you know the acceleration of the object. And we're gonna use acceleration, the term, for both positive and negative accelerations. You could think about a situation maybe where you're moving slower than you were in the beginning. So you're driving a car and you brake. Sometimes people call that deceleration. That is an acceleration. It's a negative acceleration. It's an acceleration that's in the direction opposite the direction you're moving in. And so we'll get into that when we get into some of the stuff with vectors.
um, which will be in just a second. Now, out of all these equations so far, what we really have is we have the definition of acceleration, and we can rearrange that into a uh, slightly different format to get uh, an equation where we have acceleration, time, the initial velocity, and the final velocity. Notice that there's no displacement in that equation. We also have the equation or the definition for velocity. Sorry, I'm gonna restart that thought um, because of the phone call. So we also have the definition here for velocity. And just like with acceleration, we can arrange that, rearrange that definition to arrive in an equation. Notice that we have the displacement here in this equation. We have the initial and the final displacements. We have the average velocity and the time. And so there's no acceleration in this equation. And so this equation in particular would be most appropriate when there's constant acceleration, um, or sorry, rather constant velocity, constant velocity with no acceleration, acceleration is zero. And the definition, the rearranged definition for acceleration is appropriate whenever you have a non-zero acceleration um, and you don't have any information about the overall displacement. And so notice that you might already start to think about which equation you would choose based on which information you have in a particular problem. And so out of those two definitions, we've covered a good number of equations that we can use for this motion. And here's two others that we can use. And this, you can express these in different ways. You can rearrange the variables, but if you know something about the final and the initial velocity, of an object, but you don't know the time, then you could use this equation. So the square of the final velocity minus the square of the initial velocity will equal two times the acceleration times the displacement, okay? And so this would be important to note that if you are squaring velocities, then the signs will go away. And so if you have a negative velocity, it is a little bit important to think about which direction things are going in and which direction things would be slowing down in or speeding up in so that um, you can account for those signs. But that's one equation. And of course, you could imagine how you would rearrange this to solve for any one of those unknowns. The other equation, and I'm going to use x's here for position, would be the position at time t and again, you could write this as x sub f for final. You could write this as x sub two, okay? The position at time t is gonna be equal to one half of the acceleration times the time squared plus the initial velocity times the time plus the initial position. And so out of these equations, I've given you some definitions of velocity and acceleration. And these two other equations, along with those definitions, or whether you rearrange those definitions, these are all of the equations you're going to need to solve any kind of motion word problem. Finally, vectors have magnitude and direction. And I've been mentioning that before now. Um, depending on where you're looking, you might see them expressed in different ways. Vectors could be expressed with arrows over the variable. They could be expressed with hats, especially if those are unit vectors, like in the x, y, z directions. Sometimes you might also see i, j, k. Um, they could also be expressed with bold type if you're in a published textbook, especially, okay? So for me in my notes, I will try to use the arrows for vectors. Now, if vectors have magnitude and direction, what sign should we give to vectors with different directions? Well, by convention, if you are looking on a graph, then any vectors that are going to the right would have a positive sign in the x direction, okay? And again, this might start to get a little bit into 2D kind of stuff. 
any vectors going to the left would have a negative sign in the x direction. Likewise, any vectors going up would have a positive sign in the y direction, but those would still be considered to be in a positive direction. And vectors going down would have a negative sign in the y direction. Now, based off this, you might say, well, what should you say if you're on a Cartesian coordinates, if you're on a xy graph and you have a vector going in this direction? Well, we'll get into that a little bit more when we get into 2D vectors, but right now you should say that that has a positive sign in the x direction and a negative sign in the y direction. Now, the other way to give that vector a direction would be to specify the angle. And again, we'll see more angles when we get in and do some review of the unit circle. And if you have a vector going in that direction, remember that this axis would be zero degrees here. And so you could specify that that angle is 15 degrees. That would also give you the direction. The other way you can specify direction is if you're walking on land or traveling on land or traveling around the world. You can think about the compass and you can think about north, south, east, west. And for that compass, then you can use directions like northeast or north by northwest, which tells you specific directions those are going in. And we'll put angle measures with those as we need to use those, um, again, when we really get into two-dimensional vectors, okay? So vectors have magnitude and direction. You're, there's a couple different ways that you can express them. And when you add vectors, adding, vectors. And you can do other math with them as well, but we're typically right now only going to be adding them. You always add them from tail to head. In other words, if you have multiple vectors, then you want to place vectors so one tail starts from last head so in one dimension along a x-axis kind of thing especially if you say had a number line if you started at zero and your vector went in a positive direction up to five, and then you had another vector that went in the negative direction by two, you would want to place that negative vector, and just for the purpose of seeing it, I'm going to place it just above, but we're going to pretend that that's overlapping with that head of the other vector. I can pull out two colors in a second, make this a little bit easier. But if this is a negative two, and this is a positive five, then you should be able to tell me that the vector that leaves you with, if you now go from the tail of the first vector to the head of the last vector, this vector here that is positive three, this is known as the resultant. And that's what you're going to see whenever you add vectors, okay? And all these quantities of velocity, acceleration, they're all vectors, but notice that you can't just add vectors together that have different units. So you can only add velocity vectors together. You can only add acceleration vectors together. You can't add an acceleration vector to a velocity vector, okay? because the units are different, and so they wouldn't add. Now, you might be able to transform one into the other by using another variable, but you can't add them as they are, okay?
So let me come back to the front of this card here and add one to that, that the sum of vectors is a resultant. And then I think that's actually all of the notes for today. Um, yeah. <laughs>